Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year to you. I hope that your 2021 is off to a good start. I know many of us are looking back at 2020 with gratitude that it has passed and that we can move into a new phase of healing and regeneration. Uh, regeneration and metamorphosis are going to be the focus of the Seekers Forum in 2021. Healing, self-renewal, how it is that we can use this period of darkness and destruction to become wiser, deeper, more solid people, solid in the sense of knowing our own character and feeling secure in who we are. And there's Jay. How are you, Jay? Happy New Year. Hey, thank you, Mark. Happy New Year and Happy New Year to everyone. It feels good to be here. Thanks. 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 So folks, today we're going to be talking about the way of the phoenix. Now, in ancient Greek folklore, the phoenix is that long-lived bird that cyclically regenerates itself from the body of its predecessor. It's born from the ashes of the phoenix that preceded it. The phoenix is often pictured uh, with a halo around its body because it's associated with the sun, which of course also dies every night at sunset and is resurrected with the dawn. The phoenix, of course, has become an archetypal figure around the world. It appears in all cultures from Europe, Central America, Egypt, Asia. It also shows up in world literature from Ovid to Hans Christian Andersen to uh, the Harry Potter series, J.K. Rowling. So why is the figure of the phoenix so universal? This is fascinating. And it's because, like all powerful myths, uh, the myth of the phoenix captures a fundamental truth about human existence. Just as the myth of Sisyphus represents the ongoingness of human struggle, and the myth of someone like Phaeton represents the dangers of hubris and flying too close to the sun and, and in burning oneself with unbounded pride. The phoenix represents the human capacity for reconstituting ourselves after destruction, for uh, ascending in new form once the smoke clears from loss, from pain, or from some form of, of adversity. The story reminds us that as human beings, we are actually wired for transfiguration. It is our nature to construct improved realities from the destructions of the past. That's our genius. Thriving as humans in an unpredictable world you know, requires that we birth new possibilities from the dead forms of old circumstances. As we move through our changeable lives, we learn that the Phoenix wisdom is actually inherent to the system of impermanence and regeneration behind all of life. And until we surrender to the reality of this natural cycle and we allow the old to die, of course, nothing in us can be reborn. Until we release dead forms and make way for the new, we're stuck in an argument with life itself. We're at odds with the regenerative power of this creation. Another way of saying that is that in order to be present, in order to be fully alive, we cannot be looking in the rearview mirror and stuck in the past. Now, that sounds as obvious as can be. We all know this intellectually, but it's a lot more challenging than the rational mind acknowledges, particularly when there's trauma in the picture. You know, many people are feeling traumatized by this past year. And when we feel trauma, when we experience trauma, there's a tendency to cling to the wreckage, to refuse to let go of painful losses, to get trapped either in regret or our painful victim, self-victimizing story about what has happened to us. We get caught in futile attempts to undo what has been done and a denial of conditions as they are. Without the ability to be present, it's impossible to attune ourselves to the flow of life, which is always now. You know, these unpredictable currents that are changing us uh, moment by moment by moment, whether we're aware of it or not. So rather than deny our shifting conditions and suffer their effects like unwitting victims, Awareness makes it possible for us to be changed consciously. 
To be changed consciously is very different than being buffeted by life circumstances and feeling like we're at the effect of things. We instead move toward a cooperative surrender to life's irresistible tides. And that's because awareness itself is reborn in us at every moment. And we're being altered in spirit, in mind, as well as body at all times. We're in this process of dying and regeneration. Now, this is not an abstract metaphor. You know, we understand from biology that cells actually can be brought back to life in a process that's known as anastasis. Anastasis, by the way, comes from the Greek for rising to life, for resurrection, which is, of course, the same as the phoenix wisdom. We know apparently of at least six animals that have this ability to come back to life after death. This is fascinating. The wood frog, the Arctic woolly bear caterpillar, alligators, painted turtle hatchlings, iguanas, and something called the darkling beetle. All six of these animals have the ability to die and come back to life. And of course, that makes them living metaphors for the phoenix because they defy the conventional beliefs about life and death. And they also have this mysterious resonance with the process that human beings go through of being brought back to life uh, psychologically as well as spiritually in the wake of destruction. Everyone who's ever watched a caterpillar die and emerge with wings has witnessed that magic of resurrection before their eyes. When I was a kid, there was a tree in the neighborhood park that would be covered with these black caterpillars every year. And I'd always take a few of them and put them in a jar and watch as they would uh, you know, hang there first in these sort of coffin-like chrysalises. And then they would tear themselves open from the inside and give birth to an entirely new creature. Now, though my child's mind was unaware of it, there was something else in me. It was a deeper knowing that was aware that I was witnessing a mysterious secret about what it means to be alive. It was a secret that no one really talked about, which is that we are always leaving one state and entering another. Everything is becoming. I wasn't taught that as a kid. I had to sort of learn it myself. And though I didn't have a language for it, what it really meant was that living and dying were in completely inseparable, ineluctably connected. Now, I saw with that life persists, and when we see that life persists, that it pushes through, we realize how powerful this generative force is. It breaks and twists the skin. It gives us different colors. And like the caterpillar becoming the butterfly, it discards what it no longer needs and teaches us how to live creatively in an impermanent dimension. I came to see also that this process plays out psychologically, as we all know. You know, how so-called failure can lead to success, how hopelessness can actually increase faith, and also how destructive forces like terror, uh, like rage, like aggression, can actually morph into courage and compassion and love. It's part of this magic, uh, mysterious process of regeneration. Metamorphosis contains that mystery. And it's a mystery that goes beyond physical matter and even mental processes. It's a spiritual process. It points to the heartbeat of creation itself, that rising and falling. And how it is that humans can behave so heroically under the most brutal circumstances. Now, this is more than resilience. Resilience is a catchword nowadays. This is post-traumatic growth. That's a different thing. Resilience talks about the ability to withstand hardship, to remain psychologically healthy despite adversity. In other words, to kind of hold our own. But post-traumatic growth goes beyond that kind of baseline functioning. And it refers to a paradoxical improvement in one's ability to function and to adapt. Post-traumatic growth operates in ways that boggle the mind. We survive seemingly impossible things and get stronger in ways that we could never have predicted. More often than we expect, the more terrible the threat, the greater the strength that is derived by overcoming it. Those two things are often in proportion. 
It's not accidental that the most besieged and beleaguered among us are also often the bravest. In his book about the Holocaust called The Survivor, Terence Depre writes that survivors are more urgently rooted in life than the rest of us. Their will to survive is one with the thrust of life itself, as stubborn as the upsurge of spring. Isn't that beautiful? Survivors are more urgently rooted in life than the rest of us. Their will to survive is one with the thrust of life itself, as stubborn as the upsurge of spring. And that, of course, is our phoenix nature at work. You know, it goes beyond the mere will to survive. It goes beyond the animals clinging to survival. It's a manifestation of spirit, in fact. It's a form of grace. It's a gift from the divine. It's proof of our divine nature acting through us in the form of healing and regeneration. So we are all called on continually to die to the old if we hope for such metamorphosis and renewal. And that's, of course, the meaning of mystic death, the ego erasure that is spoken of in the spiritual traditions. Ego death is a psychological slash spiritual analog to the physical death and regeneration that we were talking about. What we come to see amazingly is that ego death, which sounds dramatic and very difficult and almost insurmountable, is actually brought about by nothing more than awareness of the present moment. The state of liberation from this unwieldy ego that can seem so far away on the path is actually no more distant than now. And the reason for this is that the ego thrives only in the past and the future because the ego is a story. It creates itself through imagination. It's the story of me that repeats and anticipates endlessly. It's always backward or it's always forward, projecting itself into the future as it struggles to affirm itself in the world. And this is, of course, our great cross to bear. There's this struggling to hold on to the ego, this impossibility of being in the present moment. But if we hold our attention in the present, if we practice one-pointed attention and being where we are, we find that thinking stops And when that happens, the ego naturally falls away. This ego is like an echo chamber of me, myself, and I. It fills our minds with this din of self-centeredness. But that all-powerful ego is actually no match for the present moment. What we call being reborn is nothing more than being here now, interrupting unnecessary thought and paying attention to what is. When we do that, we are changed automatically. The quality of our awareness is new. You could say that we rise from the ashes of retrospect and clinging to the past. The phoenix is a symbol, to my mind, of present moment awareness because the moment dies and is reborn every second. We are resurrected by the breath that's forever rising and falling away if we're paying attention. Our resurrections are sometimes dramatic, sometimes subtle. You know, they can be completely transformative and, and mirrored in processes of nature, like the caterpillar and the butterfly. My friend Kim Rosen wrote a beautiful poem that I've always loved called In Impossible Darkness that I would like to read to you. It's about this metaphysical dimension of the life-death cycle. In Impossible Darkness. Do you know how the caterpillar turns? Do you remember what happens inside a cocoon? You liquefy. There in the thick black of your self-spun womb, Void as the moon before waxing, you melt as Christ did for three days in the tomb, conceiving in impossible darkness the sheer inevitability of wings. Isn't that gorgeous? After liquefying in darkness, a process that many of us are all too familiar with, you know, after this difficult time. You know, after waiting in this chrysalis, this cocoon of uncertainty as Christ lay in his tomb, we conceive in impossible darkness the sheer inevitability of wings. So why are wings inevitable? 
It's because, as I was just saying, we are made for death and resurrection. We're equipped to be reborn. We are constructed in such a way that we can rise from temporary tombs of circumstance or psychological pain into the vibrancy of life itself, that forward moving current. To the degree that we allow ourselves to be liquefied, meaning letting go of attachment, we become able to fly to new heights of insight, of flexibility, of inspiration, and of joy. With the specter of mortality hanging over our heads, as we have now you know, been going through together as a planet, as a species, you know, we're being given the great opportunity for metamorphosis that's prompted by widespread devastation. We're being called on to surrender uh, to the dying process, the death of old forms, plans, expectations, and ideas about safety, security, permanence, in order that we can dissolve the past and grow new wings or ways to move forward. So the question is, how do we do this? We all understand most of this intellectually. The question is, how do we do it? What are the signposts that guide us through this process of destruction and resurrection? An author named Martha Beck, who, whose work I really admire, has a structure that I find very helpful for understanding the phases of metamorphosis. What Beck says is that most of us will go through all of these phases more or less in order after any major change catalyst, whether it's breaking up or falling in love, whether it's getting a job or losing a job, having kids or going through an empty nest. The strategies that we use to deal with these changes will depend on the phase that we're experiencing, the phase of metamorphosis. So let me go through the four phases that Beck suggests around metamorphosis that are very, very helpful to ponder. The first one is dissolving, dissolving, which of course, you know, likens to Kim's liquefying inside the cocoon. Martha Beck tells us that this phase of dissolving is actually the scariest because we aren't taught to expect it. It's the time when we lose our identity, when we are left temporarily formless. In the event of such losses, we often find ourselves fighting like crazy to keep our identities from dissolving. And we tell ourselves, oh, it's, this is just a blip. This was a fluke. And when circumstances rock our world, we say, oh, this will never happen again. I'm the same person. My life will go back to being just the way it was. But of course, this is rarely the case. When real metamorphosis has begun, we in fact uh, run into a, a welter of dissolving experiences. The dissolution gets stronger, not more, uh, you know, not more manageable, so to speak. We find that everything seems to fall apart as if we're losing everyone and everything. And this, this can feel like a kind of death because of course it is. It's the demise of the person you've been. We may fight these feelings, we may try to recapture our former lives or jump immediately towards some new status quo, which is, of course, what rebound romance is all about. But all of these measures actually slow down this phase of dissolving, this phase one, and make it much more painful than it needs to be. Martha Beck instead talks about a few homey practical solutions that I'd like to share with you for how to deal with this dissolving. The first is, not surprisingly, presence living one day at a time, or as she says, 10 minutes at a time. You know, instead of dwelling on the hopes and fears that we have about some unknowable future, it's better to focus our attention on what's happening right now. She suggests cocooning ourselves, you know, giving ourselves physical care and, and comfort. You know, wrapping yourself in a blanket, making a cup of tea, attending an exercise class, whatever it is that brings you into your body and makes you feel good inside your own skin is really helpful during this dissolving phase of metamorphosis. Talk to other people who have gone through metamorphosis. How did they do it? You know, allow yourself to grieve, to look square at the unpleasant situation or the losses you may have gone through. And understand that you are in a normal grieving process and that you're going to cycle through the various aspects of grief in the process of dissolving into new form. Okay? Denial, anger, sadness, acceptance. Those don't go sequentially. 
but they all tend to be included in the grieving process. So allowing ourselves to experience those things also helps them to pass more quickly. This can sound passive, and it is in phase one. You know, dissolving isn't something that we do. It's something that is happening to us. And the closest we come to mastering it, so to speak, is to relax and trust that the process has a, a mind of its own. It has its own intelligence that is leading to our uh, metamorphosis. The second phase is imaging. And this is a bit more active. So after we've dissolved, we come into a stage where we imagine our way forward in time. She talks about the imago in the psyche that begins to give us instructions about how to reorganize the remnants of, of our old identity into something altogether different, just like the phoenix. The word imago comes from, of course, uh, the word image. Those two are connected. Uh, so in this phase, what you do is you start seeing images of the life that you're about to create. So this is when we play with the imagination. These images can't be forced. They happen to us, like the dissolving process itself. And they're often not what we expected because we are becoming new people, right? We're not just repeating what, what has been and what's familiar, right? We're developing traits and interests that our old selves probably didn't have. And that may leave us feeling compelled to change familiar things, you know, because the old order simply seems wrong to us now. We begin reordering our outer situation to reflect this inner rebirth. To aid this process, we should allow ourselves to daydream. Beck recommends drawing, writing, trying out imaginary scenarios until we get a clear picture of our goals and our desires. It, we save a lot of time and effort and grief by giving ourselves time to do this in our minds, in our heads, before we attempt it in the real world. Right? So we don't want to leap into ex major external changes. First, we want to play with it in our minds and see how it sits with us, how it feels to us. Phase two is all about images. It's all about making things up, imagining what's possible. And moving as we go through this stage, we feel an impulse to go from dreaming, uh, imagining possibilities, to scheming, planning to bring those possibilities to fruition. So write down both your dreams and your schemes, and then gather information as to how you might create them. The third phase is reforming, reforming. As your dreams become schemes, you start itching to make them come true. This is the implementation stage of the metamorphosis process. It's when we stop fantasizing about writing that book and writing the book or fantasizing about calling so-and-so for a date and doing so, or imagine that we're going to establish a meditation practice or get closer to our contemplative life and actually doing it. This is the moment when we take action. We feel motivated to do real physical things to build a new life. And then, as Beck says, we are almost sure to fail. Okay, after this, with this reforming stage, with this making of effort in the world to manifest what it is that feels new to us and real and authentic, we are going to fail repeatedly. And the failures themselves will feel like small deaths as we move toward our new life. But in the way that failure, the death of a failure, leads to the growth and construction of new possibilities. Failure is our ally in the creative process. Everyone knows it's not, this isn't about avoiding failure. It's about learning to fail better. In other words, failing with some insight, failing with some direction, failing with imagination, failing with a sense of humor that keeps us going. Because as we bring these new aspects of our lives to fruition, or we attempt to, it's going to inevitably bring up problems that we didn't expect. And that's why phase three, this re-imaging phase, demands ingenuity and tenacity. These are very important parts of the ability to metamorphose, to change into new forms. Is ingenuity, understanding, you know, being very canny about the choices that we make, and also tenacity, that stubbornness. You know, stubbornness is a great, is an often wildly underrated value and quality in spiritual life, in all of life, in fact. 
stubbornness that is mindful and stubbornness that says, no, I'm not going to be thrown hither, you know, hither and yon by everything. I'm going to stick with my intention. So uh, she recommends expecting that things will go wrong, not being surprised when they do, realizing that there will be failure in the sense of it wasn't meant to be or didn't live up to what I wanted it to be. Of course, that is part of the effort of finding new direction. Being willing to start over, of course, become be, remaining a beginner is key to any creative process or any spiritual process. Every time you sit down to write or every time you sit down on a meditation cushion, you're beginning again. And that's part of this phase three is this willingness to imagine, to take action, to fail, and then to start over. It's part of the same cycle of death and rebirth and regeneration that we're talking about. So we want to be willing to start over. We want to be willing to keep persisting. And then also revisit phase two and those images and learn to adjust our dreams and our schemes to include the truths that we've learned from our experimentation, right? Because our needs, our values, our desires are always changing. And a balanced life requires us to be mindful and attentive to those changes and willing to change course when it's coming from within us. We want to be stubborn when it comes to externals that are trying to throw us off our path, but we want to be tenacious when it comes to minding our internal direction and guidance. And the fourth phase of metamorphosis is flying. It's flying. So phase three is like crawling out of the cocoon and waiting for your wings to sort of expand. And phase four is the payoff time. It's the time when your new identity is forming to the place where you can actually fly. You can actually cover distance. We begin to make small improvements in our lives. You know, having gone through this scary uh, transformation, whatever it happens to be, we find little ways to make our lives a bit less stressful, a bit more pleasurable. We remember that change is just around the bend so we don't get too attached to our new circumstances or our new form. And here's the big part. This is the most important thing is that when we have grown wings, so to speak, when we've alighted anew and we've moved into a new sense of wellness in our lives, we don't attribute that wellness or our happiness to our new identity. This is absolutely uh, critical. The phoenix knows that it's more than its temporary body. It knows that it's more than its current manifestation or circumstances. The phoenix doesn't cling to its new form. Instead, it identifies with the process itself, with the spirit, and it remains identified with its essence throughout its changes. When we do this, we're no longer the prisoners of our circumstances. We no longer mistake our essential nature, our free-flying nature, for the physical cage that we find ourselves in. And that gives us power that we never had. When we separate from our picture of what the form needs to look like, when we enjoy and, and optimize whatever form we find ourselves in without mistaking it for what we actually truly are. So I'd like to do some writing now. So Jay, why don't we pull up the card, please? Okay, folks, I'd like you now to take 15 minutes to write about which phase of metamorphosis you find yourself in. Dissolving, imaging, reforming, or flying. Which of these speaks most to you? And why does it speak to you? Why do you believe that that's where you are in the phases of metamorphosis? We'll take 15 minutes to do that, please. And then we'll come back together as a group. <laughs> 